Good evening. My name is Ashton Ellett. I'm the politics and public policy archivist here at the Richard B. Russell Library for Political Research and Studies. On behalf of Toby Graham, University Librarian and Associate Provost, and Cheryl Vogt, Director of the Russell Library, I'd like to welcome everybody to the Russell Building Special Collections Libraries. Uh, and for joining us on a, a rainy, nasty evening for Kudzu and the Bull Weevil in Modern Georgia, a panel discussion featuring Derek Alderman, Jim Geeson, and Brian Drake. So before we begin, I'd like to thank my colleague, Kaylin Washnock Stukesbury, uh, who planned and coordinated this event from beginning to end. And this event is also made possible by the generous funding of the Lamartine G. Hardman III and Richard B. Russell Programming Endowments. So our panelists this evening, Derek Alderman and Jim Geeson. But before I introduce them, I'll go ahead and introduce our moderator, uh, Brian Drake. Brian is currently senior lecturer in the UGA History Department. An environmental historian, he earned his MA from the University of Georgia and his PhD from Kansas University, national champion basketball, Kansas University. <clears throat> Good timing. Um, where he studied under Donald Worcester. He is the author of 2013's Loving Nature, Fearing the State, Environmentalism and Anti-Government Politics Before Reagan, and editor of 2015's The Blue, The Gray, and The Green, Toward an Environmental History of the Civil War. Brian was also one of our inaugural Special Collections Library Fellows. I'd be, Jill would not let me leave this room if I did not say that. <clears throat> so thank you, Brian, for being here tonight. Uh, and for our panelists, Derek Alderman is Professor of Geography at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. We won't hold that against Derek. Um, he earned his MA and PhD from the University of Georgia, where he studied with Andy Harrod, a past president of the American Association of Geographers and co-founder of Tourism Reset, an interdisciplinary multi-university initiative advocating for social racial justice in travel, tourism, and hospitality. Derek is the author or editor of three books and over 140 articles, chapters, and essays. He's also the recipient of National Science Foundation and National Endowment for the Humanities Grants. Derek, thank you for being here. Thank you for making the drive. I'm sure it was terrible on 75, so. Well, I, you'd have to to drive through that weather. Same for Jim. So Jim Geeson, Associate Professor of History at, at Mississippi State University. He has been named a Goldman Eminent Scholar by the College of Arts and Sciences at MSU and a John Grisham Master Teacher, the university's highest teaching honor. An environmental and agricultural historian, he received his PhD from the University of Georgia, where he studied with the great James C. Cobb. <clears throat> His book, Bull Weevil Blues, Cotton, Myth, and Power in the American South, was awarded the Deep South Book Prize and the Francis B. Simpkins Award. Jim is currently working on a cultural and environmental history of cotton in the South, and he serves as the editor of the Environmental History and the American South series at the University of Georgia Press. So without further ado, thank you all for being here. And Brian, I'll hand it off to you. <clears throat> All right. Trust that you all can hear me, as well as the folks in cyberspace. Thank you very much. And like Ashton, I want to start out by thanking uh, thanking uh, all kinds of people. Thank you to uh, Kaylin and Ashton and Jill uh, here at the Russell for putting this together and asking me to come and moderate. Um, I've had the good fortune of working with the Russell folks for some time now, not just as one of the inaugural fellows, but but in uh, a lot of my own classes. And this is a, a wonderful resource with a wonderful group of people and I am I'm thrilled to have you. So thank you very much. Um, well, uh, great introductions. Um, I'm gonna probably add to some of the praise here uh, in my own comments, but um, I wanna start out first of all by, by welcoming you all as well. Welcome uh, to any Joro spiders who might be in the audience tonight. We're gonna ask you to, uh, to uh, not eat everything and keep your, your web high. Um, uh, I want to start out with, with a little personal story. I came to Athens in the, in the year 2007 um, with my very young son at, at the time. And we had come from Kansas, which is a very different uh, environment. Um, uh, and I decided it was time to take my son out in the, in the woods behind my house and introduce him to the Southern environment. And so we walked around in classic Southern hardwood forests and we looked at pine trees and we talked about all the creatures that lived in this new and you know unusual place, right? We'd, we'd, you know, we'd, we'd come from, from 
tall grass prairie and wide open skies. And now we were uh, surrounded by loblollies and, and what have you. And um, so my son took a keen interest and um, uh, a day or two later, he came to me and he said, dad, I have basically invented a couple of new uh, superheroes for us to pretend because we had, you know, he was, he was young enough where I, I played a lot of superhero in those days. And his, his, um, he had decided that we were going to be Fire Ant Boy and Kudzu, which I thought was the cutest thing I'd ever heard in my life. And of course, I asked Kudzu, I, I, I had the power to, to, to wrap up enemies in my very rapidly growing vines. Um, Fire Ant Boy, of course, stung people. Uh, and I just thought that was, that was, that was wonderful. Um, he is, uh, he denies ever having, having, uh, said that, but I, it, I assure you it was true, and it, but it got me thinking, um, the seriousness behind this actually about, about, about pests and invasive species and, uh, the, and cultural meaning, which is going to be, uh, the subject of, of much of what our guests will talk about today. Um, so I'm an environmental historian, um, and, um, uh, the environmental history is, is the study essentially of how nature shapes human experience, human history um, over time, and in turn, how we also shape, um, how we also shape the, the non-human world. It's a dialectical relationship over time. In other words, uh, nature matters, right? It's not just uh, a backdrop to our, our human drama, but it's one of the actors. In fact, it might be, in some cases, one of the most important actors. Um, and, I, I, and if you don't believe me, I think, I think if there's one good thing that COVID has done, it has taught us that um, the non-human world, even tiny, non-sentient bundles of DNA can shape, uh, can shape world history in ways we, we couldn't even begin to understand before it happened. Um, so nature matters. And... Um, in fact, it's been doing. It's been mattering since human history began. Um, sometimes, in fact, it's been utterly decisive. In, in, in my field, for instance, um, we know we've known for a long time that that invasive species um, played a key role. For instance, in European imperialism, back in 1987, famous historian Alfred Crosby argued that European imperialism would not have had the success that it did. Um, if it hadn't been for uh, the success of the plants and animals that the Europeans brought with them in their imperial conquests. You don't get uh, European culture transplanted to other places without horses and pigs and chickens and uh, things like that. Um, in fact, it's amazing how much um, this so-called Colombian exchange affected the environments. I think of, for instance, um, of, of the fields of impenetrable lettuce that grew up on the pampas in Brazil, for instance, um, as a result of this, um, this was in fact uh, the um, the the mix of 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 plants and animals and humans as a result of of global exploration and imperialism is some one of the most profound events in all of human history. Um, and uh, Jared Diamond is probably for lay people the most common, uh, most well-known uh, writer to, to, to build on some of these ideas, rather controversial, um, depending on, on, on uh, I guess, your, your, your take on his interpretation of world history. I, I'm reminded, in fact, of, of a review I once read of Guns, Germs, and Steel, his, his famous, famous book, which was, which was entitled Blank, Jared Diamond. Um, we're not going to be quite that uh, blunt <laughs> today. Um, but um, humans shape nature as well. Nature shapes us, but we shape nature. And in fact, what we think about it um, dictates um, how we treat it. And, and often, in fact, um, uh, our construction of it matters more in a way than, than, than the reality. So, um, Think of that words that the a couple of phrases I've been using in this talk: pest and invasive, right? Which carries with it all kinds of interesting uh, moral and ethical baggage. But when is a pest actually a pest, and who is it a pest to? When is an invasive uh, an invasive or 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 a visitor or some other phrase? So um, our understandings of nature, understandings of 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 in this case, bull weevils and kudzu and any number of other species are deeply affected by who we are, where we are, when we are, um, our, our social, political, uh, religious, cultural, uh, 
uh, construction, our place in the, our place in the in the social order, so to speak. And that's of course what we're going to learn about today. And so I had originally planned. I had did not know that I was uh, you were going to be doing the introduction. So I have some introductions planned, but I'm just going to expand a little bit on what Ashton said. So we are really really lucky to have two uh, inc incredible scholars. I have to say, first talking about Dr. Alderman. Um, I, I, I was looking at your resume and discovered it was a, a deeply intimidating 92 pages, which I can, I, I can only tip my hat and, 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 and marvel at your productivity. Um, but of course, you, you know, you've done some really interesting work um, with, with not only, not only uh, uh, kudzu, but um, uh, work on, 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 on SNCC and, and the civil rights movement. Um, President, former president of the American Association of Geographers, and on and on and on. So um, uh, I don't want to belabor the point, but, but we're immensely lucky uh, to have you here, as we are with Dr. Giesen as well, who um, is, uh, as, as, we, as we learned a minute ago, a master teacher. And I was, I was pleasantly, uh, I was impressed to discover you have a teaching award named after in fact, for the Agricultural uh, History Society, which I think not, not a lot of us can claim. Um, and again, your book is one of the most well-known pieces of, of Southern environmental scholarship. Um, an, an absolute must read for anybody who does a Southern environment. And um, I could go on, but again, it published extensively in, in uh, journals like Agricultural History, which was one of the most important in my field, and on and on and on. So we are deeply uh, lucky to have uh, two uh, true experts talking about uh, the subject today. So um, I'm going to welcome to you again to, to, to Georgia native species, so to speak here, to, uh, to, to fill us in. So with that, I will yield the microphone to, I believe, uh, Dr. Alderman, I believe you're going first. Uh, it's up, up to you. So. Yeah, you want to be able to see it. Yeah, go right ahead. Yep. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be trying to get through a lot of remarks tonight, and because uh, you got me on a tight timeline here, and so uh, I'm going to do the best I can. Uh, I, I will like to uh, allow me to thank the Russell Special Collections for this kind invitation to speak and that very, very generous introduction. And I'm sorry you had to labor through the 92 pages. That's usually how you uh, keep people from discovering the truth about your real record. Uh, and as an alum of UGA, I'm uh, very uh, honored to be able to come back here, very honored to see some colleagues from the Department of Geography here, some friends from the Department of Geography. Having my wife Donna here with me is uh, terrific. In addition to being the love of my life, Don is also one of my collaborators in this sort of stuff of dealing with kudzu. Um, been run out of a lot of fields together, uh, interviewed some people together. And so uh, if I say anything that's out of bounds, it's absolutely her fault. Uh, I've been writing about kudzu uh, on and off for well over two decades. And I'm interested, as the title suggests, in untangling the complex place of kudzu in the Southeast with really a lot of attention to my home state of uh, Georgia. I am a Georgia boy. Um, and as a cultural geographer, and I'm always very uh, strategic about making sure I uh, identify myself that way, uh, as former president of the AAG, I am contractually obligated to mention it. This is where you laugh a little, enjoy yourself. Uh, but really place for me is used very intentionally. Uh, place is not just the sheer location of where kudzu grows or not. It's not just how kudzu affects the look and health of landscapes. A focus for, on place for me is about how kudzu is in, incorporated into people's biographies, their social practices, their cultural expressions, their structures of feeling, what we geographers call a sense of place. And as seen in this picture that you have on the slide from a seafood restaurant in Macon, Georgia, some citizens see and treat kudzu as a point of identity, and they show a very clear willingness to associate themselves closely with the vine by name. Uh, naming patterns such as this sometimes strike people as odd. They may appear at first glance to be shallow as mere window dressing, uh, but they, in fact, are, I think are pretty significant. They signal that kudzu is being understood as more than just an ecological pest, that people are embracing the vine as iconic, 
rather than simply hating it. And I've argued for some time, uh, given the theme of our session tonight, that uh, any effort to manage kudzu in a very practical, material way uh, must have a full understanding of those cultural impacts of kudzu and how people uh, interpret, experience, and use the vine in a variety of different ways. And indeed, I would argue that these cultural connections uh, between people and kudzu can potentially complicate these calls for wholesale eradication. And to illustrate the bizarre ways that kudzu can become, in fact, incorporated into Southern culture uh, and turn shape how we treat the plant, I, I want to take you outside of Georgia to a place where Don and I lived for about 12 years near Lenore County, North Carolina. And in 2011, residents of Lenore County encountered this kudzu growth you see here on the screen. Residents claimed that this kudzu draped over the utility pole resembled the crucifixion of Jesus. The kudzu Jesus, as it came to be known, uh, made national headlines, more because of the way locals treated it so sacredly uh, and less to do with its actual likeness to Christ. Um, the manager of a nearby hot dog stand, you can always learn deep theoretical things from hot dog stand operators, by the way. Uh, I, I know I do. Uh, he, 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 he went on the record as saying that he almost spread the kudzu with herbicide when first seeing him, but then thought better, explaining, oh, I glanced at it. It looked like Jesus. I thought, you can't spray Jesus with Roundup. Now, I don't know if you're an ag agnostic or fundamentalist when it comes to the religious implications of kudzu, but it's impossible to deny that the vine occupies a very complex place within the Southern cultural landscape. It's cursed by some people, it's protected by others. Um, kudzu entangles itself, not just around our utility poles, but also around our belief systems. And this in turn shapes the terms of any war that we may wage on this fast growing vine. And to understand why a seafood restaurant would name itself kudzu or kudzu would get mistaken for Jesus, one has to acknowledge that people have long defined the relationship with this plant in multiple and sometimes contradictory ways. And it really goes back to your point, Brian, at the very beginning about the construction of nature uh, and how nature then in turn comes back and acts upon us. Uh, since being introduced to the US in the late 1800s uh, via Japan, Kudzu has had many social and ecological roles or what I would call careers. Kudzu's perceived usefulness has shifted with public opinion, it shifted with land use trends, it shifted with advancements in science and also the changing demands of the American economy. It was established initially as a novelty, but it has become a hero, it has been a villain, and more recently it's become a rehabilitated criminal uh, in the words of historian Ken Kenbacher. And what I've tried to do is I've tried over my career to build upon some path-breaking work by a geographer that many people maybe don't know, but uh, he was a great influence on me, John Winberry at the University of South Carolina. Uh, and what I've tried to do is work uh, sort of on top of John's work in trying to have a better understanding of these major stages in the development of Kudzu's reputation and, um, and specifically some of the important people, uh, some widely known, some not widely known behind that uh, those stages of that development. And I also recognize, however, that a graphic like this is, is uh, inherently flawed because the plant's relationship and impact on humans has always been contested from the very start. And that these very neat generalizations really don't always hold up over time, but they're useful in terms of getting us thinking about uh, a general history. And, and many of you probably already have a pretty good understanding of what that story is. Uh, kudzu began its tenure in America as an ornamental uh, used for decorating and shading homes. It, it was introduced as a result of trans-Pacific journeys and exchanges between American and Japanese horticulturalists, including the very famous plant explorer, David Fairchild, who I think last time we counted was responsible for the introduction of at least 200,000 different species or varieties of plants and crops into the US. Um, and by the early 1900s, magazines such as Good Housekeeping uh, promoted kudzu's fragrant blossoms and promised that its dense canopy of stems and leaves could live 25 years or more without any care at all. 
And the first half of the 20th century, especially the 1930s, signaled a major turning point for kudzu, uh, shifting from really a porch oddity, it's often called the front porch vine, to being becoming an agricultural resource. Conservationists and government officials touted kudzu as a miracle vine for feeding livestock, replenishing nitrogen poor soil, and controlling erosion along fields, hillsides, and road banks. Massive planting and public relation campaigns were carried out across Georgia um, and, and, of course, the entire South. They were providing money to farmers to uh, plant kudzu, even though the farmers were rightly suspicious of kudzu. And in fact, people were employed during the Great Depression to cultivate the vine along highways and railroads and on public lands. It was a key part of, um, of the New Deal in that regard. Uh, I've spent a quite a bit of time studying this gentleman here that you see pictured, Channing Cope. Uh, Channing Cope played a major role, he's from Georgia, played a major role in constructing Kudzu's savior status. And on his Yellow River farm in Covington, Georgia, uh, Cope experimented with kudzu cultivation. He then also used his farm to popularize these environmental moral claims about kudzu. Um, uh, Cope called kudzu uh, the Lord's indulgent gift to Georgians. So the religious connection is not just there in Lenore County. Uh, North Carolina. Uh, very interesting, uh, Cope established the Kudzu Club of America, which held kudzu planting contests. Uh, Cope promoted kudzu co propagation in his newspaper columns, his radio shows, which you see him hosting there, and he even planted the vine on other people's property in the dark of night without their permission. He was a zealot. Uh, I guess in that regard, he was a kudzu fundamentalist. <laughs> Well, you guys are starting to warm up. It's about damn time. Uh, but kudzu was Cope's life, but it was perhaps the cause of his death. And I had a very interesting oral history with Phil Cohen, one of the good friends of Channing Cope. And according to Phil Cohen, uh, the, the kudzu became so thick on Channing Cope's farm, the Yellow River farm, that teenagers would flock there at night to party without any sort of adult interruptions. Well, one night, uh, Channing, and this did not, uh, Channing Cope did not care for this, so every night he'd go out on his porch and run them off with his shotgun, and one evening he stepped off his porch and died of a massive heart attack. So um, that's where you're supposed to show a little sympathy. All right. But beginning in the 1950s, if not sooner, scientists, foresters, and farmers were vocalizing uh, the dangers of kudzu's out-of-control growth. And for those who are not really up on it, I mean, kudzu under optimal conditions can grow six, uh, can grow a foot a day. It can grow 60 to 100 feet within a growing season. So it's nothing to play around with. State and federal government officials eventually removed kudzu from its list of approved ground covers. The USDA eventually labeled kudzu to weed and later to add insult to injury, uh, gave it the legal designation of a noxious weed. Um, Time Magazine listed the introduction of kudzu to the U.S. as one of, the, of one of the 100 worst ideas of the 20th century, along with DDT, prohibition, asbestos, and leisure suits. <laughs> I need to apologize because there are some people out there, I won't point to my colleagues in the back from geography, that like to feel polyester against the skin. So I... Uh, but the, 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 the demonization of kudzu has, had, uh, has led to a host of conventional and unconventional methods of control. This includes the return to uh, the use of grazing animals uh, and also the emergence of whiz kids like Jacob Schindler. Uh, Jacob graduated from University of Georgia, but when he was a lot younger as a kid, he experimented with using helium to kill kudzu roots and actually had uh, some success with it. Supporting these control practices was a vilifying of the vine in scientific, popular, and policy publications. Kudzu went from being a miracle vine to being called a plant thug. Uh, Georgia-born author James Dickey was famous for saying that kudzu was, he called kudzu green, mindless, unkillable ghost. And, uh, and he said that in one of his uh, famous 1960s poems. Uh, experts suggest that this discourse of fear and disaster that has been placed around kudzu, while seeming to be, I guess, a bit funny in places, has had some pretty important consequences. It's distracted our attention from uh, 
our attention from other threatening invasive species and pests. And also making kudzu an evil invader uh, has also sidestepped our own role in, introduce, in introducing the plant to begin with and our own responsibility for the climate change that appears to be driving kudzu spread outside of the South. Um, so while that very disaster laden language is important for mobilizing action, it also think has some consequences to uh, blocking or cutting us off from seeing some other issues. And as geographer Paul Robbins uh, argues, biological invasion is not just a product of invasiveness or the aggressiveness of certain species, but also the invadability of certain landscapes as shaped by human forces. Yet the wholesale disrespecting of kudzu was never complete. And as by the 1980s, we began to see signs of a tempered enthusiasm for finding some usefulness for kudzu. A cottage industry emerged in which Georgians and Southerners made kudzu vines into paper, jewelry, and baskets. Citizens of Jasper, Georgia is pictured right there, constructed a massive basket from dried kudzu vines in a hope of setting a world record. Entrepreneurs converted blo kudzu blossoms into jams, jellies, and soaps. Uh, extracts from kudzu roots, long used for medicinal purposes in Asia, are now available in the herbal uh, market. These products and crafts, they certainly look like it's about making money and is about making money, but it's actually, I think, uh, rooted in a deeper redemptive impulse. And I learned this really, I think, nicely from interviewing two kudzu artists, Diane Hoots of Georgia and also Nancy Basket of South Carolina. Nancy is pictured there. Hoots and Basket um, are interested in transforming this malign kudzu into something beautiful and useful. And Nancy Basket is of indigenous heritage and she represents a really very interesting convergence between the exotic and the native. She incorporates Cherokee stories and to the content, the technique of her kudzu based sculptures and paper collages. Uh, Miss Basket also considers her approach to kudzu uh, to be distinctly feminist because she stresses that she's trying to find practical uses that can help feed her family and others over what she calls the blunt male fixation on mass eradication. So for other Georgians, redeeming kudzu has not been about requiring it to, by actually trying to transform it, rather it's about trying to offer a different visual interpretation of the vine. And for some people, images of kudzu growing over abandoned buildings, junk cars, appliances, and trees is a photo opportunity and a chance to reimagine the plant aesthetically. Jack Anthony of Dahlonega, Georgia, who I've had the pleasure of working with and meeting many years ago, He's made a post-retirement life out of capturing the evocative uh, kudzu topiaries and landscape formations. David Day and his photograph is there. Uh, he's a Georgian transplanted now to Connecticut. That has to be tough. Uh, and he's experimented with infrared photography uh, of kudzu. And his photographs are very evocative. They show kudzu with these white leaves and vines, almost giving the appearance of clouds and snowfall which is a real interesting counterpoint to James Dickey's invading green ghost. Uh, but, you know, much of my work over the years has focused on, in a very linguistic way, trying to understand how people talk about kudzu, incorporate it into their words, and then use kudzu to make sense of their broader environmental and social realities. Um, uh, I've, I've done a lot of search of national newspapers. It's one of the things that makes me so cool, you know, as a researcher. Uh, but it is something I do enjoy. Uh, and I find that people are really using kudzu as a metaphor or a point of comparison uh, for talking about other issues and events uh, in sometimes amazing ways. Uh, perhaps unexpected or perhaps expectedly, kudzu is an important way of talking about other invasive species and the, and the threat they pose, whether they're talking about hydrilla, uh, nutria, or even the fire ant, uh, fire ant boy. Uh, but kudzu also makes its way into conversations having little at all to do with animal and plants. Uh, it's become a shorthand for dramatizing any form of uncontrollable growth, whether it's urban sprawl, red tape in DC, social media, or more recently, COVID. And in 1973, and one of my favorite sort of metaphorical constructions of kudzu, 
uh, George's award-winning author, Alice Walker, deployed the metaphor of kudzu in characterizing the, the difficult work of civil rights in Mississippi. She wrote, racism is like that local creeping kudzu vine that swallows whole forests and abandoned houses. If you don't keep pulling up at the roots, and by the way, kudzu has a very deep root system. It's sort of the nerve center of the organism. It will keep growing back faster than you can destroy it. And Alice Walker was not just responding at the time to what she saw in Mississippi, but she was also responding to her own background in Putnam County, Georgia, which has its own share of kudzu and its own share of racial inequalities. And there's actually a long, deep pattern of associating kudzu with racism, according to historian Kathleen Riley. She's documented some Northern reactions to kudzu, and she's found, I think, some amazing evidence of Northern uh, journalists and writers in the 1950s and 60s using kudzu as a metaphor for describing the South as a wild, decaying space struggling with poverty and white supremacy. And later, as she documents in the 1970s and the 1980s, Northerners would express sincere, very deep concern about kudzu invading and threatening the North, even though the vine had long grown above the Mason-Dixon line. Um, and according to Riley, kudzu for Northerners at that time was a potent symbol for their own anxieties about the South's growing influences in the country, what's been sort of more popularly termed the Southernization of America. And while kudzu continues to be scorned by many inside and outside the South, the vine is increasingly embraced by others and incorporated into their cultural activities and symbolic associations. And people sometimes express a very close personal positive connection uh, between their identity and the identity of kudzu. Those connections are no more than apparent than we look at kudzu themed tattoos. Um, and just to put any speculation to rest, that is not my leg. <laughs> References to kudzu are found on billboards, postcards, as well as in novels, music, and artwork. And often these creative expressions treat kudzu as intrinsically Southern, as if kudzu belongs in and to the South, which I think is quite interesting. The use of kudzu as a Southern symbol um, or symbol of Southern identity is especially strong when we look at naming patterns. And so for those who don't know my work, I get so excited about naming, place naming, how to organizations, institutions, people name themselves. It's one, of my, uh, it's one of my real passions. And so I've tried to provide you a few examples here on the screen. Kudzu has been the name of a, a, a few uh, Georgia musical groups, including a 1970s Southern hard rock band and a current group performing uh, Celtic music with what they call a Southern accent. You guys are a tough crowd. I just want you to know that, all right? Because I'm laying out the big stuff. In contrast to the often uh, negative environmental impacts of kudzu, kudzu is actually associated with programs devoted to physical and spiritual well-being. A camp for kids with diabetes in Atlanta and a college ministry in Milledgeville. Um, again, I'm on to something, religious angle. Nothing. There are 45 roads in 10 southern states named uh, for kudzu, and Georgia claims about the second largest number of those streets. In 19, this is one of my favorite stories, by the way, in the 1980s and 90s, Jim Downing drove a line of Mazda race cars under the kudzu name, uh, cars that he designed, by the way. And it's, he did it as a tribute to his father, who worked with the Department of Agriculture in the 1940s to plant kudzu in Georgia. And as Jim describes it, kudzu was practically a member of the family. So it made all the sense in the world to include it. And so I guess one of the points I wanna make here is that kudzu no doubt operates at a wider societal, ecological and landscape level, but it also operates at a personal, emotional and symbolic level that has received a lot less attention from scholars. And I've got to move here because I'm running out of time, but I do want to mention one last thing here. Uh, let's sort of bring this to full circle and come back to where we started the talk as kudzu seafood in Macon, Georgia. And by the way, I think I should receive some sort of compensation for now promoting that business twice <laughs> in this talk. Some years ago, I worked with a group of students and I, I, and I was talking with Jim about this. We had some fantastic students. And we tried to identify and map and survey businesses that use kudzu in their name. Um, 
we found about 108 commercial establishments in 21 states that bore the name kudzu. They were well outside the South, but most concentrated in the Southeast. And Georgia accounts for over one third of the nation's kudzu businesses with many in the Atlantic area, Atlanta area, as you can see from that map. The great majority of the South's kudzu establishments are small scale. They employ one to two people. The exception is uh, kudzu fabrics in Roswell, Georgia, which I think last time I looked employs about 250 people. Um, by the way, these kudzu businesses uh, have really almost nothing to do with horticulture, kudzu crafts, or even invasive species control. They cover almost every other kind of business that you can imagine. And my students and I, and this is the exciting part, we conducted surveys and interviews with the, a sample of these owners of these kudzu businesses. And those discussions were quite revealing. I mean, these entrepreneurs identified with kudzu to assert what they saw as their southernness of the name and also their market image. And in doing so, um, they were creating what I've called in my work a regional symbolic capital. They were using the kudzu name to confer a sense of regional distinction and a sense of, of, of market uniqueness and a Southern consciousness. Uh, and they were hoping to connect and attract customers rather than drive them away. And it was not an empty signifier to these people that we spoke to, but in fact seen as a very valuable identity narrative. Uh, the, the vast majority of owners of these kudzu named businesses recognized that kudzu, we asked them straight out, they recognized that kudzu was not native to the South. They also recognized, almost all of them recognized and stated that they knew that the kudzu was a destructive species, but none of them agreed that kudzu should be eradicated. And almost all think that the vine has some redeeming value. And so while naming one's place of business after kudzu, again, may appear to be trivial, the practice actually speaks very powerfully to how humans are working and reworking, uh, maybe even taming the meaning of kudzu. And there are potential consequences, I believe, and how that naming shapes how the public responds to kudzu and imagines the vine's future in the South and in Georgia. So I'm gonna wrap it up there, but I thank you very much for having me. All right, a couple of clicks here. about that slide uh okay well everybody has thanked everybody but thank you so much for the invitation it's so great to be back here to see so many um old friends and and colleagues and and uh it's, it's wonderful to be back in georgia particularly in this big building uh which was not here when i was here this would have made research so much easier uh and i thought that i would uh talk well i'm going to talk about the bull weevil in three phases i want to sort of tell the story of um, how I came to think about the bull weevil, how my questions about the bull weevil changed, but I'm going to do it sort of around sources. Since here we are at an archive, we'll talk a little bit about sources. And then part two is what I found, what I argue in my book about the bull weevil. And then finally, I want to raise some questions about invasive species. You're going to hear lots of the same things you've heard with Derek and Brian's uh, uh, from them already. Um, but the bull weevil is, I think, different than kudzu, different than some other invasives, um, but it kind of gets to some larger questions that I think we can talk about uh, at the end. So I first started thinking about the bull weevil. Um, I'm not a Georgia boy. I uh, grew up in Michigan, a long way from the nearest cotton field. And I first started thinking about the bull weevil when I was uh, in Indiana as an undergrad at a little liberal arts college in Indiana. And we had a class in the 20s and 30s. And I uh, we had to read this book. And the author made this simple point that the Great Depression was not uh, some fantastic event in the life of Southern farmers because Southern farmers had never experienced the Roaring Twenties. Things had been so bad for so long that there wasn't this, it wasn't like in the cities where all of a sudden unemployment skyrocketed and, and that's the Great Depression. And in just a couple sentences, the author said, you know, the reason Southern farmers had never, had, had had this terrible time in the 1920s was this thing and that thing, but mostly because of the cotton bull weevil. And he presented this image of the bull weevil just absolutely decimating Southern cotton. Painted this picture that was um, 
really like a plague. It was like biblical uh, in the description. And I thought, this, this just like stuck in my head. And it's funny thinking back, right? That like two or three sentences in a book that I read when I was 21 has really changed the course of my life. And then I'm still thinking about this, this idea uh, so many years later. Um, so as I got through graduate school and moved around, I sort of step, kept thinking about the bull weevil. Uh, and when it came, to find it, uh, came time to pick a topic for my dissertation, uh, I chose the bull weevil mostly because I was attracted to this idea. And this is kind of the nascent stages of environmental history. This was in the late 90s. Uh, I mean, environmental history had been around, but it was new to me, so that's so it was new. Right? Uh, but it was interesting for me as someone who'd studied Southern history and th thought about politics and economics to think about this non-human force, right? That if you go by the, the classic definition, the classic bull weevil history, it's that farmers were kind of passively victims, made victims by this little insect uh, that had all the power. I liked that idea. And I thought there was a lot to dig in there in dissertation. So uh, I went to the archives and uh, I began, I, I went kind of looking for evidence of all this destruction. And it's, it's what I found. To give you a sense of what the bull, bull weevil uh, was and is, uh, let me just tell you some facts about it. It's the first thing I discovered in the archives, right? The bull weevil, pictured there, uh, sitting on top of a cotton square. It's a little brown, grayish bug about the size of a, a pea. It's got a big, long proboscis, which it uses to puncture this, the cotton square. Uh, the females then deposit eggs inside the square. Uh, if you think about all those cotton fibers that you saw in that last picture, before they bloom, they're inside that square. Uh, the larva uh, feed on those little fibers, they hatch, it kills the bull, the square drops to the ground, they hatch, little baby bull weevils, this is very scientific, little baby bull weevils <laughs> crawl out and they um, fly and they go off and looking for, in search of the next cotton square uh, to destroy. It was originally from, or originally discovered in Central America, uh, had probably lived in Northern Mexico for a long time until, and now we're thinking about humans here, until farmers in the 1880s and 1890s first started planting cotton in the very Southern, uh, in South Texas. So uh, when, the, when that cotton arrived, it linked up this bull weevil habitat with basically an all you can eat cotton buffet that stretched all the way to the Atlantic Ocean, right? See, I didn't have to tell them to laugh, and they laughed at that one. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, why is a bull weevil so destructive? Um, a bull weevil is so destructive because one single pair can account for 9 million offspring in a single growing season. So if you start to just think about those numbers, right, uh, it can move quickly. It can, it can destroy a lot of cotton. And by all measures, it did destroy lots of cotton. And so that story of the destruction really was um, pretty easy for me to find. I started out by going to the university archives and looking at records of the Georgia Department of Agriculture, the Georgia Extension Service, and um, the records of experiment stations, places where they were um, uh, doing experiments, investigating the science of the bull weevil and of cotton and a bunch of other things. And all of these documents that I ran into told this story of the bull weevil's destruction. In the old library, I used to go into this place uh, called the Georgia Room. It was my favorite mm -hmm. little room, and it just had all the Georgia books. You could check out the books, I think, but no one ever went in there. It was a great little uh, place to um, get a bunch of work done. Uh, and in the old archives up there on the second floor. And then I even ventured to this place. Humanities folks are going to uh, be amazed by this. There's a whole other part of campus. If you walk past the football stadium, there's all those buildings over there. They're, then they've had their own library. It's like a science library. There's a weird statue out front, right? With like an old man or something, you know that statue? So anyway, I discovered the science library. I was the one, the first humanist ever crossed the bridge over to the science library. It really did feel like that at the time. And you, I just wandered around all of the, the um, stacks and all of the old historic scientific literature um, and everything that scientists had published on cotton and the bull weevil and I spent a lot of time over there. 
my point here is that that um, methodology really influenced what I was finding. I found a bunch of stuff that, that, that scientists wanted me to find and that the extension service wanted me to find. So they were documents like these, right? Here are two uh, College of Agriculture Extension Agency uh, documents. The one on the right is actually the first, I looked through every single uh, issue going up to this point. I think this is 1909-ish, uh, 1916. The first use ever of red ink. Yeah, that's a, it was a technological marvel back then. But you think about the, the size of the bull weasel portrayed on these flyers, the red ink thing, get right into the bull weasel, make no mistake, attend the short course, meaning they wanted farmers to come to Athens to learn how to fight the bull weasel uh, and how to grow a bunch of other stuff other than cotton which in its own way was gonna fight the bull weasel. So these are the kinds of documents that I first found uh, at the USDA level, you know, at the federal level, they were things like 1909, the bull weasel problem, special reference to weeds of reducing damage. So these are nationally employed um, entomologists and other kinds of scientists who were uh, searching for solutions to the bull weevil problem. The solution pictured here, of course, uh, row sprayer coughing up probably calcium arsenic or some other kind of um, poison to the bull weevil, poisoning the bull weevil. So these are the, uh, the first documents that I found. Even, of course, newspapers get into the game as I expand my search away from just government kind of science and documents. I find that newspapers are, are reprinting all of this information, right? To try and get the, the news to local farmers uh, about how to fight the bull weevil the bull weevil's coming, all that kind of thing. But the more I read, the more I had some questions. For instance, if the bull weevil is destroying all of this cotton as it marches across the south, why are people continuing to grow it? Why does it, if it's really so devastating year after year, when it's in Mississippi, for instance, how are Mississippians still coping? Like, how, how, why are they planting it year after year? Um, shouldn't all that cotton be gone from now? And so, or by then. So um, as my research expanded from Georgia into other states of the Deep South, I started to pay attention also to the timing of the invasion and crop statistics uh, about the bull weevil's advance. And I started to kind of look at those uh, agricultural flyers, those bulletins that were being uh, issued by the Texas entomologists. Mississippi Department of Agriculture and the USDA, of course, and, and look at when are they um, when are they saying what in relation to where the bull weevil was. Now these maps, I'm going to show you a couple versions of these maps, and I I write about these maps for pages and pages in the book. So like one of the things that I, as I was researching really um, kind of clicked in my brain for me is that when the scientists made these maps, they were basically just trying to show the extent of where the bull weevil could be found, right? So 1892, on the coast of Texas, moving a little bit every year. But scientists had one intention with these maps, but then they would get reprinted in local newspapers or regional agricultural farm newspapers. Uh, and they would be kind of stripped of their scientific explanation so that if you're a farmer in Georgia looking at this map uh, in 1911, you're thinking, uh-oh, right? It has destroyed all, it's sort of like completely destroyed all that part of the South. And so this led to a kind of fear about the bull weevil that I was finding in um, lots of these documents. Another example of that showing the bull weevil as, it, as it's moved all the way across uh, the South. So I began to sort of think through the sources about ways that um, the bull weevil Reality wasn't matching this idea of absolute destruction. I also began to look at hard data of crop statistics. Now, this was a lot harder way back in the dark ages of 2002 than it is today. Um, this involved big, heavy USDA books and census books um, in the basement of the old, old library uh, and converting these numbers into a spreadsheet. Uh, these days, it's all the USDA has digitized it all, and it's like 15 seconds to find all the crop statistics that you need. But um, what I started to look at were certain counties across the South 
And what I started to find was that cotton wasn't being destroyed everywhere. That in fact, there were certain places within the South that saw cotton uh, acreage increase and cotton production, the amount of har the harvest of cotton increasing even after the boll weevil had arrived. And so I started to identify places in the South where this story didn't really make sense. And I sort of tried to match up um, songs about the boll weevil, stories about the boll weevil, all of this, like um, even those government documents, trying to match up those places with the, with the parts of the South uh, where the boll weevil story didn't kind of jive with what I was thinking. So what I realized to make uh, a long argument brief is that I had thought that the audience for those flyers were farmers, right? Here's how to be a better farmer. Sometimes that was, uh, well, there were two things. Poison the hell out of the bull weevils, right? That was advice number one, or don't grow cotton, grow something else. Part of this larger modernization of the South idea. But what I figured out the more I read is that the audience uh, was not farmers, it was politicians, and it was government workers, and it was the public. Why? Because making the bull weevil into a huge threat was a tremendous opportunity. It had tremendous advantages for lots of different people and institutions across the South. I'm not going to go through them all. The biggest, it's especially true at places like the University of Georgia or Mississippi State University, land-grant schools that were in the early stages of their land, land grantedness. Uh, and they were looking for more federal and state funding. By making the bull weevil into a big problem, they were the ones who could solve the problem. And it wasn't just cotton experts and entomologists, it was home economists, right? It was people who wanted Southerners to stop growing cotton, but to grow more peanuts or to raise hogs or chickens or to diversify their crops in some other way. By making the bull weevil into this big threat, they could get lots of attention and they could get federal money, state money, they could get um, lots of people uh, to bend to their will in, in various ways. It wasn't just land grant schools, uh, making the bull weevil into a huge threat was also a way that political uh, reformers could preach modernization, agricultural diversification, as I said. So this little pest came to carry the weight of a lot of calls for pretty radical change in the South. Uh, it was big among railroads uh, who wanted farmers to grow different stuff so that they could ship more stuff across uh, the country. Fertilizer and pesticide companies. Uh, sorry, this is uh, an example of, this is actually in the exhibit. Uh, uh, this is an example of a, like a full page ad that the uh, extension agents would take out, beat the bull weevil. And at the bottom, if I zoom down here to the bottom, it's basically ask your county agent. Your county agent might help you with your bull weevil problem, but what they're probably going to say is uh, grow less cotton, do something else. So uh, I was talking about the, the pesticide ads. If you look through um, Southern farm newspapers in this period, of course, or even just local newspapers. They're full of all kinds of um, ads for bull weevil poisons and different methods for applying those, those poisons. Again, making the bull weevil into as big of a threat as they, can, as they could. Um, but as I said, it's also peanut, hog, and corn uh, processors, the people who want to make money with farmers growing other things. Even tenant farmers, I uh, talk about in the book um, a specific case in the Mississippi Delta where sharecroppers who um, saw the bull weevil arrive and um, went to the landowner and basically convinced the landowner, like, look, uh, you should rent this land to us because the bull weevil is going to destroy all this cotton. And I'm not willing to pay you rent rather than a share of the, the measly crop that you know, we're going to get in the case of the bull weevil. So you even had. Uh, you know, landless tenant farmers across the South using the threat of the bull weevil to try and uh, change their, their situation for the better. Anyone who was interested in change in the early 20th century South was interested in the bull weevil. So that explains the question of why the hysteria of bull weevil rhetoric didn't really match that reality on the ground. 
But what about the actual changes in the farming itself? Environmental historians constantly zigzag between culture, right? That's what I've just been doing. It was the idea of the bull weevil to back to, but there is a material reality, right? And we need to understand that material reality. Uh, because there is no doubt that the insect destroyed lots and lots of cotton. By the estimation of Cotton Incorporated, uh, it, it estimated that by 1990, the bull weevil had destroyed a trillion dollars worth of cotton between 1890 and 1990. So what I found was that, yes, there were plenty of places in the South that stopped growing cotton after the bull weevil moved through. We can talk about specifics if you uh, want to during the Q&A about where those little places were, uh, particularly like the Piedmont of Georgia, the Piedmont of South Carolina, uh, which stopped growing cotton as the bull weevil was coming through. Um, they blamed a lot on the bull weevil, which uh, wasn't the bull weevil's fault. But for all of those places, there were Mississippi deltas which actually expanded the amount of cotton that they were growing, got really good at growing cotton in the face of the bull weevil um, for a bunch of different reasons uh, and grew more cotton. And in fact, nationwide, if you just take the national number, more people were growing cotton in 1930 when the bull weevil had come through and were growing cotton in 1890. They were producing more cotton as well. So the bull weevil was both things, a real material devastating force on cotton and also an ideological threat. And I argue in my book that the bull weevil was a greater lever for change in the 20th century South as an idea, as a threat, than it was an actual destroyer of cotton crops. Though I go to great length to uh, explain it's not really either or. So um, let me transition into part three here and just kind of talk about uh, what I think the bull weevil can tell us about this larger invasive questions. And many of this is um, what Derek and Brian have already said, but um, the, the history of the bull weevil tells us that when you're thinking about invasives, language is really important. Like uh, just this word, we've talked about a bunch of words, Brian made a bunch, but the word import, right? Which gets to this idea um, that someone is crossing a border, right? Someone is bringing something in or an invasive species uh, is being brought in. Uh, imported, but, but like those borders that they cross are rarely ecological. They're mostly political. They're, they're, they're political borders created by humans, right? And you see that in the language of invasive. So if you just do a Google search like I did, like top 20 invasive species right now, half of them, about half of them, a little less than half, had uh, a geographic name affixed to it, um, either a country or a uh, continent. So we think about the Mexican cotton bull weevil, Asian carp, Burmese python, Japanese beetle, and the killer bee, right? Or the Africanized bee. The whole idea of invasive is uh, a cultural concept as much or more than an ecological one. There's the moment Derek talked about where the USDA uh, just all of a sudden calls kudzu a weed. Right? And that language, just that description means, okay, now we can treat this natural thing uh, much differently. So uh, the last example I want to use is this thing called the zebra mussel, which is in the Great Lakes. Uh, it started in the Black Sea. It was brought to the Great Lakes uh, in the bilge tanks of freighters um, that would use would suck up Black Sea water as ballast, right? And then they'd get to Lake St. Clair, which is a little lake that unites Lake Erie and Lake Huron. Uh, off Detroit, and they would dump it, and zebra snails got out into the lake, and it now spread throughout the Great Lakes. Now, I, um, I go to the Great Lakes regularly, and the greatest thing, well, the, the most visible effect of zebra mussels now invading the Great Lakes is that the water is super clear. It, it eats up all the cloud, the, the plankton that makes the water cloud, and so it has this cascading effect that ends up killing bald eagles. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, um, but I did a like, you know, just let's look at a couple of articles on zebra mussels and see about the way that they talk, since this is a relatively new invasive species. The zebra mussels had pilfered the region's food supply, creating a vast aquatic desert. Like an environmental historian could write an entire dissertation just on those words, right? A vast aquatic desert. What is an aquatic desert, first of all? <laughs> uh, but it's also not true by any measure of what's going on in the Great Lakes. 
the zebra mussel had already colonized rivers and lakes across uh, Western Europe. Like colonized, I think about ecological imperialism, right? This is the same kind of thing. All right, so um, the zebra mussel story made me depressed when I read it and I tried, I tried to think about, is there a lesson that invasives can um, give us today that sheds a little bit of a positive light on anthropogenic climate change, right? And I think maybe there is. Uh, the bull weevil legitimately scared people into action, right? Lots of different people in lots of surprising ways, not always predictable ways. Uh, but that fear of the bull weevil was real. That was a natural threat that prompted action. Can we get to a moment where climate change uh, is scary enough for people that they will actually turn uh, uh, to solutions? The difference, of course, I'm not gonna end on a positive note, is that during the progressive era, they, they, people recognized um, that the bull weevil was a threat that could only be solved by the government. Right, and that doesn't seem to be uh, something that um, most people across the world have, have settled on with climate change solutions. Right, looking to see who's going to solve it. Is it the billionaire? If he stops shooting his rockets into space, is he going to solve the problem? There's a lot of talk, or is it going to be some consortium of countries working on things with some political and economic solution? 